Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I can see that there are people who are presently um, tuning in or signing on or whatever it is that one does with, uh, with Zoom. And so I'm going to give you a few minutes for that to happen. And then I'm going to introduce our speaker today and then we shall get underway. Getting underway is, I think, the appropriate uh, metaphor for today's lecture. Um, this is the second in the series of history reclaimed webinars on Britain's struggle against the slave trade. And it's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome uh, Professor Andrew Lambert today, who is the Lawton Professor of Naval History at King's College London and the director of the Lawton Naval Unit. Uh, he's, he's the author of prize-winning books, in 2014, he won the Anderson Medal for The Challenge, Britain Against America in the Naval War of 1812. And uh, one of his most recent works is the, is the, if I may say so, the extremely ambitious and original uh, work, Sea Power States, which meaningly subtitled Maritime Culture, Continental Empires and the Conflict that Made the Modern World. Because as those of you who have read the book will know, um, much of it is about the creation of a maritime culture, which is the, 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 the foundation of the power of sea power states. And today, we're very, as I say, we're very, we're very glad to welcome uh, Professor Lambert, who's going to talk about the Royal Navy's struggles against the slave trade. So, uh, Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be here and to have... Um, a captive audience, um, that's a metaphor I won't use again, uh, for a discussion of one of the Royal Navy's longest running and most difficult campaigns. As you all know, and I'll share my screen now. In 1807, Britain rendered the Atlantic slave trade illegal at a time when the Battle of Trafalgar and the ongoing war against Napoleon meant there were very few ships traveling across the Atlantic that were not British or working in Britain's interests. And it then tasked the Royal Navy with enforcing that law against the very small number of British ships that attempted to continue carrying slaves on the transatlantic route. There were very few lawbreakers because most British ship owners at that time could find perfectly legitimate and relatively profitable business in what was a booming Atlantic economy. The end of the Napoleonic conflict in 1814 and its slight repeat in 1815 com complicated and changed the picture quite dramatically as former enemy and occupied countries rushed to regenerate their merchant shipping and their colonial holdings and the colonial trades that supported them. The British could see problems emerging they used the peace process to press the Europeans to follow their lead in abolishing the slave trade, but Spain, Portugal, and France all refused uh, for a variety of reasons, most of which were concerned with recovering and restoring their devastated tropical colonies to profit, uh, and also to conciliate the colonial elite, elites who were then either attempting or thinking about rebellion. These countries also were concerned that the mechanism for abolishing the trade would be the Royal Navy stopping and searching merchant ships flying their flag, which they saw as an infringement of their sovereignty and a continuation of the Royal Navy's highly successful economic warfare practices against Napoleon and his allies, but also against the United States in the War of 1812, practices which had been raised as an issue by the French and the Americans in the attempt to make peace at the end of 1814. But the British had insisted that they would not discuss this issue. The right to stop and search merchant ships in wartime on the open ocean was a red line for the British. And it was not even considered at the Congress of Vienna or the Treaty of Ghent. And this certainly rankled with the French and the Americans who would very much like to have restrained Britain's maritime economic power. And this is a theme you'll find across the long 19th century, well into the 20th, of continental military powers anxious to stop Britain using the sea 
as a strategic means of applying pressure against their weakest element, which is usually their economy. Having seen their economies devastated by British naval blockades, the French, the Americans and others had no desire to see this practice extended in peacetime. Consequently, the Atlantic slave trade expands after 1815, and one of its vehicles is the transition from privateer warfare by the Americans and the French uh, to the use of privateer vessels and often crews switching into this different form of, of illegal activity. The Atlantic slave trade in the 18th century had been conducted by relatively standard merchant ships overloaded with human cargo, but relatively standard ships. After 1815, most of the ships used in the trade are fast, uh, usually American built schooners. And here we see the Pride of Baltimore in the colored image, uh, a ship designed for very high speed, but relatively limited cargo carrying capacity. This means that the, the number of slaves that can be stowed on board is limited. Um, but this is the only kind of vessel that will be effective in operating in an Atlantic if the British are able to impose their rules. So we have unemployed privateers, we have unemployed privateering craft, we have a range of wars going on in the Caribbean at this stage, 1815 through to the late 1820s, wars of independence and liberation by a succession of former Spanish provinces and of course Brazil all of which have differing policies on the slave trade and slave economies. So a lot of people are moving into this business at the end of conflict in much the same way that piracy had surged at the end of the War of the Spanish Succession. What does the British policy actually look like? Well, it's 10 or 15, slightly more ves uh, small vessels operating on the northern half of the African coast, that is north of the equator, and trying to limit the movement of human cargo. The issue for the British is relatively simple. They've agreed to outlaw this trade and they wish to uphold the law and British politicians and statesmen are committed to that program. Across the next 50 years, British warships will capture 1,600 slave ships approximately, and it, they will do so at the cost of more than 2,000 casualties, almost entirely fatal, and almost all of them casualties of local tropical diseases. This was not an easy campaign, and it was not cost-free. In the Royal Navy of the early 19th century, you were more likely to die on the West African anti-slavery patrol than in any other deployment. The cost of this long campaign would cause domestic opposition as well as international. And one of the things I want to highlight is how the Liberal Party was split down the middle about what to do with the anti-slavery patrol. In 1833, Britain abolished slavery in the British Empire, and that reduced the possibility of further demand from the British side. But of course, in the Caribbean and North America, there are many places where slaves are in very large demand uh, following the growth of plantation economies, producing goods uh, like sugar, coffee, uh, which demand huge amounts of labor. So these powers, the American South, Brazil, um, see the slave trade as essential to their economic well-being and they are not persuaded by the moral case that Britain is making. The problem for Britain is to find a mechanism by which it can end the slave trade without causing a major war with other major powers. So while there is an ideal at the bottom of all of this, there are much more complex issues involved in persuading rather than coercing great powers like France and the United States to stop trading. The Americans made the Atlantic slave trade illegal in 1807, say shortly after the British. But because of the sectional interests of the American South, this law was never upheld uh, and it remained something of a joke right down to the American Civil War. Uh, slave trading was 
put on the statute book as akin to piracy with a penalty of death for those who were captured conducting it. Only one man was ever hung as a slave trader in the United States, and that was in the middle of the American Civil War. So the Americans were not capable of suppressing the trade because of the sectional pressures within the pre-Civil War United States. The French were not willing to give up the trade for very obvious reasons, which include their possession of Martinique and Guadeloupe, which had large um, agricultural economies. Spain and Portugal, the other major European trading powers, were somewhat easier to put pressure on because they were no longer great powers. And Portugal in particular was rather dependent on Britain for security. But this is a constant balance. The ability to suppress the slave trade depends on Britain's relations with other major powers. How far will other major powers allow the British to stop ships that are flying their flag legitimately or otherwise on the high seas and search them and inspect their papers. The Americans invariably refuse to allow this uh, and so for much of the period do the French. There's a great deal of drama in the, in the abolition of the slave trade and here we see uh, the ship Black Joke capturing the Spanish owned, but almost certainly American built slaver El Almirante. Uh, the Black Joke was a former slave ship which had been captured. Uh, the Royal Navy discovered that its own standard cruisers were not actually fast enough to capture uh, slave trading vessels. So there were dramatic incidents like this celebrated in this case in a major public print, which reminded people of the cost of the activity, but it was not being brought to a successful conclusion. The wars of the 1820s, particularly in the Americas, uh, compromised Britain's ability to operate here. All the states that resist British pressure do so for powerful, if not necessarily morally valid rationales, and they have a very interesting agenda here. The Americans protested that while ships were flying the Stars and Stripes, they were not actually American ships. Um, it turns out almost all of them were actually built in America. All the best slave carrying schooners were American built, mostly in Baltimore. Uh, these ships would carry multiple papers. They would carry at least one person who could claim to be a citizen of a country other than the United States, um, normally Portugal or Spain, but most of the crew would have been American, particularly in the early years of the trade. The Americans finally set up their anti-slavery patrol in 1842, but it was not intended to be effective, and the United States Navy was generally looked at, controlled by politicians from the American South, most of whom were slave owners uh, and had a vested interest in it not working. It was there to stop the British interfering. The men who made a difference here, other than those who served on the patrol, and many of them were committed abolitionists, were the foreign secretaries of the period, particularly Henry John Temple, third Viscount Palmerston, foreign secretary in the 1830s, the second half of the 1840s, and then prime minister in the late 1850s and into the middle of the 1860s. Palmerston was a lifelong abolitionist. He was absolutely committed to this cause, it was one of the two things he thought most important in what was a very long and very impressive political career. And he was prepared to use pressure, diplomatic and naval, to persuade the weaker countries in this trade to break with this process. The diplomatic and legal complexities of running the blockade were really very serious. Turning a noble gesture into con concrete fact involved hard work, gathering intelligence, processing through courts and building relationships. Many of these slave ships were condemned in prize courts in which British and Portuguese, Spanish or Brazilian judges sat together. It was necessary not just to convince a British judge that this was a slave ship, you had to convince the judge coming from the country where the ship was nominally registered. And that puts an enormous pressure uh, on the process. 
So gathering intelligence, capturing the ship's papers, these are all really important things. The due process of law, as we would understand it today, has to be followed. So for 50 years, this trade is going to continue. But why was there such a large trade? It's demand-led. This is not a trade that exists for its own sake. It's a demand-led trade. The millions of enslaved peoples who were shipped across the Atlantic were shipped because there was a market that was ready to take them and pay a premium for them. Uh, there was also a very large supply uh, on the coasts of West Africa. Remember that the slave trade out of West Africa was endemic and had been active long before the Europeans began trading across the Atlantic. Uh, trading in African enslaved people to North Africa had been a commonplace since the ancient world. Uh, there were slave markets in Morocco, Algiers and Egypt and there were more slaves traded across the Sahara than were traded across the Atlantic. So the first thing that has to be done to deal with a trade like this is to remove demand uh, and at the same time hopefully limit supply. All you can do at sea is limit the trade and if you want a modern analogy you can look at western attempts to suppress the cocaine trade in the Caribbean. There is a large demand, there is a massive supply, uh, and people can make a lot of money in this business. This is an economic activity for all its moral repugnance. It is an economic activity. So here are the areas where the majority of enslaved peoples are being removed from. One of the issues to remember is that the bottom half of that map is off limits for the British until 1840s, so they're only dealing with the West African half of this trade at that point. There is a, a large market because many of those West African regions and states have a long history of sustaining the trade. The sheer numbers involved are really quite striking. The Angola coast, five and a half million embarked, nearly five million disembarked, about 12% losses en route, and we see other trades even larger. So there are some very large numbers involved here, 12 and a half million people in this period. The Royal Navy's patrol was never going to stop that trade. There were never going to be enough ships. The whole Royal Navy would have found it difficult to stop this trade. Key problem for those addressing the problem of the slave trade is health. This is extremely unhealthy territory. Uh, malaria and yellow fever are endemic on the west coast of Africa. Uh, they are spread by mosquito, as we all know. They did not know this. So some captains worked out that it was unwise to be near the coast when the sun set and all the mosquitoes came out but they worked it out not by modern methods, but just by essentially guesswork and experience. So casualties are high. It's difficult to operate close inshore. So the, the patrol is basically waiting for slave ships to put to sea and then having to try and catch them. So very difficult situation. The attempt to deal with demand begins in the late 1830s under Palmerston's foreign secretaryship. The state of the patrol at that stage is relatively weak. It has unsuitable vessels and it is not stopping very many slavers. The British have no legal authority to search ships carrying slaves between the Portuguese colony of Angola and various Portuguese stations on the Congo coast and into a strong Brazilian market. It was also necessary for the ships, if they were to be lawfully condemned, to actually have slaves on board. So you can't stop a ship that is heading to load with slaves. The British solved this by introducing what they call the equipment clause. So if you stop a ship and it has all the equipment to carry slaves, and that would be manacles, very large cooking pots, and very large stowage of water, uh, you can then condemn it on the basis that it is equipped for the trade, even if there are no enslaved people on board. And this was put through in 
a treaty with Spain in 1835, and it was critical to moving the trade out off the Spanish flag uh, towards the Portuguese flag. Portugal was reluctant to accept this, but the British were willing to bully Portugal in ways they wouldn't even with the Spanish, let alone the Americans. They insisted because Portugal's security and its economic prosperity in the 19th century depended very much on its relationship with Britain. And the British had always been prepared to engage very forcefully in the defense of Portugal uh, against external powers. Uh, the Tagus River is the center of Britain's Atlantic strategic uh, control all the way through the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, those of you who think that the British sent an army to Portugal to drive the Spanish, uh, drive the French out of Spain have missed the point. The army was sent to keep the French out of Lisbon and the Tagus. Anything beyond that was a bonus. So Portugal could be bullied. And by 1839, Portugal's slave trade is being degraded and the Portuguese are not really in a position to complain. What this measures do is it persuades the British that they're going to have to do something. And you can see here uh, the Portuguese numbers are, are very high in the period that we're looking at. Portugal is the largest by flag uh, trading nation in the slave trade from 1807 through to the, the end of the Atlantic business. So we're looking at very large flows out of West Africa heading into Brazil. We're looking at similarly scaled flows going into the Caribbean and quite clearly into the United States. The United States slave economy is not regenerating. It is being fed from the Atlantic trade. Uh, the myth that there are no slaves imported into America in this period uh, is entirely without foundation. Uh, many slaves are being imported often uh, through third party action coming out of places like Cuba. So the United States and Cuba and Brazil are critical. And what the British are going to have to do to break the trade is to break that dependence and to impress upon the authorities in those countries just how important this is. The leader of the anti-slavery patrol in around 1840 is a man called Captain Joseph Denman, who is one of the most prominent abolitionists and a very vocal and effective campaigner for the abolition movement. Uh, he runs a much better blockade than some of his predecessors. Spanish, Portuguese and Brazilian ships by 1840 can be searched anywhere in the Atlantic and the equipment clause does apply to them. Uh, better ships have been sent, including some of the Royal Navy's early steamships. And the steamship gives you a huge advantage because you can now chase um, a fast slave carrying schooner into the eye of the wind and you can overhaul it without any trouble at all. But this is a costly investment. You need not just more ships, more expensive machinery, you also need a large supply of coal and like everything else that is in short supply. Denman demonstrated his zeal by landing at one of the slave stations at Galinas and he destroyed the factory where the slaves were collected and sold. Uh, this led to a long running legal action where the owners of the slaves and of the station complained that he had violated international law. Uh, the case ran on for six years, but it was ultimately decided in Denman's favor. And this in 1848 is a major blow to the West African trade. British courts have upheld the right of the Royal Navy to go ashore and destroy slaving facilities. Foreign Secretary 1841 to 46, um, Lord Aberdeen is more conservative in his attitudes and he ends coastal raids like the one that Denman had conducted because he's not sure they're actually legal. Um, it turns out, of course, they are. But he was quick to place the anti-slave trade effort in context. He didn't want to alienate the Portuguese, particularly because the Tagus was so important. But he was keen to put more pressure on Portugal. By 1842, Portugal has conceded the equipment clause, and that means the Portuguese are no longer the primary carriers of trade of slaves in the trade between Africa and Brazil. This, these are now Brazilian flagged vessels. 
And this shifts the target. Brazil is much more exposed to Britain uh, even than Portugal. Destroying the, the Brazilian trade will be a critical blow. Remember that Brazil at this stage is not a republic, it's an empire, it's run by an emperor, and it has an aristocracy. It also has a large planter class. By 1845, there are 21 warships active on the African coast, including much faster sailing ships and seven steam vessels. So the possibilities of the trade are being weakened. The Brazilian trade is also moving into the steam age. We tend to think of this as a sailing ship trade. Right at the end, it's British steamships chasing Brazilian steamships. Um, Palmerston returns to office as Foreign Secretary in 1846, and we now get the most serious attack on the anti-slavery patrol of them all. This doesn't come from the United States or Brazil, Portugal, Spain, or France. It comes from the radical wing of the Liberal Party. The Anti-Corn Law League, led by Richard Cobden and John Bright, protest that paying extra for sugar that was grown by free labor rather than by uh, slaves uh, was disadvantageous to the working classes and that the cost of the anti-slavery patrol was extortionate and was unnecessary. And they put a motion into the House of Commons to stop doing both things, basically to buy the cheapest sugar and to stop paying for a patrol against the Atlantic slave trade. Lord John Russell's government made this a vote of confidence on the slave trade patrol, uh, and both Russell and Palmerston spoke very powerfully in support uh, of the cause to which both of them were committed, and they won that vote of confidence. They did not win the economic vote on buying cheap sugar from Brazil and Cuba, where it was grown by slaves. Uh, the interests of cheap food trumped uh, that of morality. Palmerston's return to office in 1846 increased the pressure, and we now get the introduction of even more effective ships onto patrol, and the decision taken in 1849 to transform the, the anti-slavery patrol from West Africa to the coast of Brazil. Royal Navy vessels, which had been operating in, in the River Plate in a war between Uruguay and Paraguay and Argentina, were released by the, by the making of peace. And the British minister in Brazil then switched them to conducting a very active campaign against slave ships in Brazilian waters and harbors. So the end of the anti-slavery patrol at south of the Atlantic is British warships inside um, Brazilian harbors capturing and destroying Brazilian flagged slave ships under the guns of Brazilian forts. On one occasion, a Brazilian fort fired back uh, but the British captain ignored them, uh, towed out the Brazilian ships and destroyed them. Brazil was now in a very difficult position. It could either defy the British and essentially go to war, or it could recognize reality. In this case, the Brazilians backed down. They then declared that the slave trade was in the hands not of native Brazilians, but of Portuguese. And of course, Brazil was very keen not to be part of Portugal. So this was a very defamatory statement. The slave traders were excluded, not for their morality, but for their nationality. Portugal is, uh, is already out of the trade. Brazil is now following it. So when the Port Brazilians make these concessions, the British pull back their blockade and relax their efforts and very quickly, Brazil ceases to Im import slaves and the slave trade becomes illegal in Brazil. This is a critical movement because it closes one of the two great markets. Attention now switches back to Northern demand. And here the complexity is the island of Cuba, a classic slave trading image, Royal Navy ship with lots of sails set chasing a slave schooner, which is doing the same thing. Is the coast of Brazil. This is where the slave trade is mostly operating, and it is the ability of the British to stop that trade, uh, particularly in the southernmost port there, Paranagua, which was a key slave importing station. 
that was so important in resolving that. The trade drops off in the south and is now increasingly focused on Cuba, which does have links to the United States. Cuba is the last remnant of Spain's empire in the Caribbean. It is largely owned and run economically by the Queen Dowager, who is the regent for the young Spanish queen. She has extensive economic interests in Cuba. And Cuban wealth and Cuban trade is the basis of the regeneration of the post-Napoleonic Spanish economy. Much of the trade with Cuba is handled out of Barcelona, as closely connected with the Catalan region, as well as the, the Spanish South. For the Spanish, Cuba is the last vestige of empire. It's also the last hope of recovering empire. And any attempt to, to force them to abandon plantation slavery in Cuba uh, would have met with significant resistance. The British were unwilling to do this because Spain hostile would have complicated their European diplomacy and perhaps opened Spain up to the influence of France and the Franco-British Franco rivalry for influence in Spain in the 1830s and 40s is highly significant in developing the wider picture of British relations. The Spanish marriages crisis of 1846 being a classic case in point. What the British do is then further complicated by the position of the, of the United States. In the mid 1840s, as you all know, the United States launched a war of aggression against the Mexican Republic, which it seized large parts of what is now the Southwestern United States, California, Texas, New Mexico. And the United States then began supporting, if only covertly, filibustering ex expeditions to try and take over parts of Central America and bring them into the United States. These campaigns were run from the South, many of them out of New Orleans. Their purpose was to maintain a favorable balance in Congress between slave owning states and non-slave owning states. This is of course part of the buildup to what would be the American Civil War. And the biggest and most attractive target for these filibustering expeditions is Cuba. So in the late 1840s, the Royal Navy finds itself trying to stop slaves being imported into Cuba, but it can't be too zealous on this half part because it will lose the support of Spain. At the same time, it needs to patrol Cuban waters to prevent the Americans launching an invasion legally from the government or illegally through filibustering because Cuba is the key to the entire West Indies. Havana is the most important harbour in the entire Caribbean region and an American fleet based in Havana will close the Caribbean to the British and indeed everybody else. So this is a really important issue for the British going forward. Havana there you see right in the middle on the north coast of Cuba and the passage between Florida and Cuba is critical and then very short distance to the Yucatan Peninsula and you're into the Gulf of Mexico with Jamaica just down to the south. So strategically very important to keep Cuba out of American hands, very important to try and stop the slave trade too, but the two things are in tension, they're not in harmony. One of the ironic results of all of this is that the British send a ship to patrol Cuban waters ostensibly to look for slave carrying vessels. This is the ship HMS Trincomalee and if you live in the north of England, it's quite easy to go and visit the Trincomalee, which is preserved in Hartlepool, uh, looking pretty much like this. The Trincomalee is sent not to look for slave ships because it's a relatively slow ship. It's sent to warn off the Americans. Its purpose is not anti-slavery. That's the cover story. The real story is this is British power on the spot, deterring the Americans from launching an invasion of Cuba. So again, it's about graduated and modulated expressions of interest. The commander in chief in the Caribbean at this point is a very famous naval officer who most of you will know as Lord Cochrane, uh, the 10th Earl of Dundonald, uh, 
by now a veteran, but one of the heroic figures of the Napoleonic Wars, he's been sent out there to make sure that nobody misunderstands Britain's willingness to fight. He is a, a combative and highly aggressive officer. And by sending him out there, the British are saying, we have the ships and we have an admiral who is ready to deal with this problem. The British response to the Americans is always modulated by the realization that, and some, this is something that Palmerston stresses, that in the event of conflict between Britain and the United States, the British will have a major advantage over the Americans. In the War of 1812, the British had used slave rebellion as a key part of their strategy to defeat the United States. The invasion and capture of Washington DC in 1814 was entirely set up by raiding operations in Maryland and Virginia and the encouragement of enslaved people to run away and acquire their freedom by joining uh, the, the resistance movement. The British set up bases to which they could go and all of those formerly enslaved peoples were given their freedom where as soon as they joined the British and the African American populations of Trinidad and Halifax, Nova Scotia are descended from those people. They were not sent back to America, despite the Americans demanding them back as property. Uh, the British treated them as, as free people uh, and offered them refuge within uh, the wider empire. Palmerston was convinced that if the Americans picked a fight with the British, the first thing he would do would be to send British troops, many of them of African or West Indian origin into the American South to raise a slave revolt. So this was the weak point of the United States and it was something Palmerston was acutely aware of and very willing to think about. In the mid 1850s, he said that if the Americans picked a fight with the British now, they would find they would have less stars on their flag uh, because the Southern states would be overrun by British troops and slave rebellion. So the British have controlled Spain into minimizing its slave trading, but they are not prepared to strong arm Spain into stopping the slave trade because they fear that Cuba would break away from Spanish control, weakening Spain and reinforcing the United States. So again, what is possible as well as what is desirable? British were still unable to stop American flagged ships carrying slaves across the Atlantic. It was illegal for the British to stop an American registered ship on the high seas and check its papers. As a result, they were obliged to resort to other methods. In 1851, the British destroyed the slave station at Lagos, which was the largest on the West African coast. Major landing operation, uh, Royal Navy, Royal Marines capture and destroy the base of a large slaving empire. In 1861, the British annex Lagos and begin the creation of what would become the colony of Nigeria. And this is about extending legitimate trade, suppressing illegal trade and finding opportunities to build new relations with local players. As medical knowledge improves, it is possible to operate in this area. But of course, 1861 is the end of the Atlantic slave trade because the main market is destroyed by the outbreak of the American Civil War. Uh, as soon as the two halves of the United States have split and the Union has established a blockade of the Confederacy, there is no possibility of trading slaves across the Atlantic into the United States. So the market disappears. By 1865, there are very, very few ships attempting to make this voyage. By 1866, the commander of the West African Anti-Slavery Patrol reports there is no intelligence of any attempt to do this at all. So removing the demand is the ultimate rationale for ending the Anti-Slavery Patrol. With no demand, the Royal Navy was free to switch its attention from the West African slave trade to the East African slave trade. That is another story, but the Royal Navy would be involved dealing with that trade out of the ports of East Africa into the Arabian Peninsula and beyond. Uh, 
right the way down to 1900. So this is the first half of a century long campaign against the illegal movement of enslaved peoples across the world. That the House of Commons and the British people generally supported this campaign throughout its long and grinding duration, I think is a great testament uh, to the commitment of the nation uh, to deal with this issue in a thorough and effective way. And the skill of the naval officers and men on the ground who delivered this result and of the politicians who oversaw it uh, needs to, I think, to be better recognized. Um, it is perhaps for this that Lord Palmerston has a statue um, on Parliament Square. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lambert. Oh, there's Palmerston, yes. Um, uh, and from a very interesting talk, uh, which taught me a huge amount that I had no idea about. And um, uh, I'm going to uh, provide a little breathing space for our, our audience by asking you a first question, if I may. And could I suggest to all the participants that they should use the, the question and answer, the Q&A command uh, at the bottom of their, of their screen and write in their questions or indeed on their, I suppose you could use chat, but if we all use the Q&A, that's probably easier. Uh, so please do write in your questions and I will pass them. I will select them and, and pass them on. So, I, I mean, I, I was, I'm very interested, um, well, I have lots of potential questions, but could I start by asking you to say a little bit more about one of the heroes of your, your story, who is Captain Denman? Uh, what, what sort of a man was he? What, what was his, what, what was driving him in his uh, commitment to abolitionism? Um, Joseph Denman is a very successful uh, naval officer who comes from a family of abolitionists. So this, this is not just personal, this is a familial commitment. And he has chosen to serve on this station more than once. So right through his career, he sees this as the station where he should be deployed. And it's his commitment that leads him, in the case of Galinas, to essentially overstep his instructions and to land on the territory of a foreign power and, and commit acts of both violence and destruction. Um, if a Royal Navy captain did that today, I suspect his career would come to a grinding halt. But the popular support for Denman's action and the support of the Foreign Secretary meant that instead of being penalized, he, he was lauded and his career went on uh, up to the rank of Admiral. So what we look at is a relatively small number of officers whose commitment to this cause is such that they deliberately pick this out as the place they want to serve. It's worth noting, of course, that in peacetime, so after 1815, your chances of getting promoted for doing something brave and brilliant had evaporated. Uh, defeating the enemy was no longer a, a very obvious thing that you could do. This was a place where you could display your skill, your seamanship, your judgment. You could do something noteworthy. And it was in those days perfectly possible to be promoted for doing some distinguished service. So I think we have to give Denman the credit for being absolutely committed, but it didn't do his career any harm to do great things on this station. He was one of many uh, young officers whose career was made by the success he had in delivering this anti-slavery patrol. So if you could get your name in the public print, uh, you could get a letter published uh, recording what had happened. Uh, there was every possibility that the Lords of Admiralty would move you up a step. And that was something that many young officers had no other means of achieving. So this was quite attractive because it was a live and dangerous station and you could make your name here as well. So we're looking, I think, at two things, both an, a noble commitment uh, and a desire for professional advancement. But is it, is it true that it was also very risky in the sense, not only because you might get, get malaria, but if you, uh, you could lose a legal case and were you not then held responsible personally for, for damages or something of that kind? Yes, in, in Denman's case, the damage he'd done was enormous. He, he destroyed an entire slave factory and it would certainly have, have bankrupted him had he been found liable. But also with illegal captures, and that is the case in war as well. So in the, in the Anglo-American War of 1812, American ships that were illegally captured 
could be returned with damages and you would be we'd be liable for that as an individual um, in the 21st century hm government would cover those costs for you but in the 1810s that was not the case you would lose your shirt uh, as well so yes it's dangerous in economically it's also dangerous because many of these actions necessarily involve boarding vessels uh, that's a physically dangerous business and the slavers um, tended not to surrender unless they were absolutely forced. And the usual way of stopping in a merchant ship at sea in the age of sail is to knock the sails down. But you then have to persuade the crew to surrender. And that means firing into the ship itself, which is something that Royal Navy crews were unwilling to do when the ship was packed with, with human cargo. So you tended to use boarding action rather than gunfire to stop and capture these vessels. So the casualties in hand-to-hand -hand combat were, were a significant element. Once you captured the slave ship and, and then began to release the people, you may well find that the people on board are subject to an endemic disease and this will then infect your crew. This happened on several occasions. So the Royal Navy was very quickly persuaded the best thing to do was to capture these vessels, remove the crew and and the, the enslaved people and destroy them because any slaving vessel that was sold on the open market ended up back in the slave trade mm. so they would destroy the slaving vessels uh, very publicly to make sure they weren't reused i was going to ask you a bit about the 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 practicalities of it so and obviously you you, you wouldn't want to fire into a into the into the hull of a, of a ship packed with slaves but on the other hand you as you were saying you've got to capture it with its human cargo in order to prove it was a slave ship until the uh, the the clauses that allowed you to identify it by by barrel you know barrels of water or, or manacles or whatever so they seem they sometimes fired at the sails was that, was that one of your pictures i think seemed to show that yes uh, it, and the the slavers would be doing exactly the same thing trying to slow down the the chasing vessel by knocking its rigging away so your ability as a sea officer, a skilled seaman, to catch one of these fast-moving vessels um, was a very high test of, of professional capability. And remember, they're firing with fairly primitive muzzle-loading smoothbore weapons. These are not precision tools. So you're asking a great deal of your crew in doing that. There is, I think, a great le a level of commitment on the part of those involved which was only reinforced by the experience of capturing and, and boarding one of these vessels and realizing just how horrific the, the conditions were. Mm. So we find some officers and men who went on the patrol because it was a, they were sent there, coming back as committed abolitionists and public proponents of abolition. Uh, this was something very nasty and, and experience of it was life-changing for many people. Uh, quite a few questions have come in. So, uh, uh, two about about numbers. W one, could you could you say what the relative, roughly speaking, the relative size of the trade into Brazil and South America, as opposed to that into North America, was? Well, thank you. That that's a very good question, and and it's a moving target. So, down to the late eighteen forties, Brazil is a very significant part of the number. Forty. 50, perhaps 50% 50 of, of enslaved people are, are going from south of the equator across into the Brazilian economy. And with the closure of the Brazilian market, the overall numbers in the trade drop, but obviously they're now going through Cuba and many of them are ending up in the United States despite the uh, stipulations of Congress that this was illegal and equivalent to piracy. So it's constantly moving but the the numbers across the period so we got around 12 million people moved in the period from 1815 through to the end of the trade in the 1860s uh, so that gives you a rough idea how many people are being moved every year the, the figures are fairly fairly static across the period until well into the 1850s when they start to drop off um one question is about the alternative markets for, for West African traders I mean, were, were there alternative markets for slaves taken from West Africa they weren't sailed around uh, 
uh, the Cave of Good Hope, where they up into the Indian Ocean, presumably. Uh, were slaves for the Arab market taken either overland or from East Africa? In yes, I think that that is the right that is the right conclusion. The the overland trade through Egypt provided a route into the Arabian market. Uh, East African slavery is is a very large issue and and has been for even before the Europeans arrived in the Indian Ocean. This was a very very big uh, trade with well established patterns of trade, which the Europeans blundered into when they rounded Cape Horn. Very limited amounts of of movement of peoples from West Africa by ship into the Indian Ocean. It was, it was too far um, and you were too likely to run into British warships. So it, it tends to be the overland trade that is servicing into the Arab market and the East African because there is plenty of demand in, in the New World. And it's, it's a question where the demand is that's driving this. There is still demand for an East African trade long into the 19th century long after the West African trade the demand has dried up. I remember one of my Africanist colleagues, John Eilif, saying that, uh, indeed he's written this, that uh, African traders, African sellers of slaves, were threatening to kill their slaves if Europeans didn't buy them. So when the British were trying to put a stop to the trade on the West African coast, there were, there were, there were threats against slaves by, by rulers and slave traders were saying, well, if you won't buy our slaves, we'll just kill them. So it shows that there was no there was no alternative to um, to the American to the Americas as a, a market. I think that is I think that that's good evidence there. But it it also emphasizes the point that we have to bear in mind for men like that, they are trading in a commodity. They have no sense that these are human beings. Hmm. This is something that they are trading, and if they can't bring it to market in an economically attractive way. They will dispose of it um, in a way that costs them the least money. Why? Why would they maintain a large number of, uh, of, of people alive if they can't sell them for profit? Mm, um, yeah, seems to be the case. So while the British are looking at this very much in in terms of, of morality, and uh, the people running the trade are looking at this in very much in terms of economics, and the synergy there is between those people saying that if they can't move their, their slaves they will kill them and the anti corn law league saying well you know we don't want to pay a premium uh, either to see this horrific trade ended or indeed uh, for the sugar we want to buy very cheap food and we don't want to pay any any taxes for anything like this mm. uh, the fact that this went as a vote of confidence in the house of commons in a in a government that they, as part of the wider Liberal Party, were allegedly supporting, uh, I think is very telling. Um, the domestic agenda is very important and maintaining support for this patrol is a critical part of the messaging that's coming out uh, in the press, most of which is, is very positive, uh, through the Foreign Office, through Palmerston, people like that. Palmerston is, is managing the press quite brilliantly. Uh, in all the things that he does, but this is a, a particular interest of his. At the end of his life, Palmerston said that he was proud of two things. He had stopped the Atlantic slave trade and made his country safe against an invasion. And they're both tasks that the Navy conducts. Uh, so it's, it's no accident that he's supporting the Navy and supporting men like Denman who are solving the problem that's being raised by this trade. I suppose what, what we've been saying shows that it was also important for, to, um, to provide alternative sources of income for West African rulers. So, I know, palm oil, which is now, of course, uh, something that we, d we disapprove of, was then seen as, a, as an alternative uh, industry and export item, wasn't it, for, previously, um, for, for those who had previously been involved in selling people? Yes, the, the development of an alternative was, was a key part of the strategy. Obviously, it's not the Royal Navy's job to, to introduce people to the new, new trade goods. But palm oil, it takes off in this period because it is an alternative crop. Um, and we also see missionary societies promoting this idea. So we get early attempts to ascend the major rivers of West Africa and, and open up trading relations with inland powers in West Africa. Um, almost all of which end 
with the usual catalog of, of malaria and yellow fever deaths uh, and, and sadly failure on a large scale. But technology is starting to play a part. By the 1840s, there are iron steam powered vessels that can go up West African rivers in ways that had never been possible before. By the 1870s, medicines are starting to, to be available uh, that will help deal with some of these problems. And it's no accident that Britain has a very large school of tropical medicine and, uh, right in London, and it's closely connected with the Navy. Um, keeping naval personnel alive is, is a really good thing, whether it's scurvy, malaria, or yellow fever. Um, a few more questions, indeed, quite a few more questions I'd like to pass on to you. One is about the number of the, the you, you met you, in one of your tables, you pointed out the percentages of embarked slaves who did not arrive, uh, um, uh, presumably largely from disease, from disease on, on, on route. Uh, and the questioner asks, how different was this percentage of mortality from that of uh, cr sailors or, or passengers on, on similar ships? Thank you, that, that's a very good question. Um, anybody sailing in West African waters close to the coast is at risk. You know, this is not a, a benign environment. Of course, for the slaves, many of the diseases they're dying of are not West African diseases. They're diseases connected with travel. They're also dying of despair, um, homesickness, um, alienation, uh, the violence of the crew. Um, slave ships don't all make it, and these very fast, um, American designed schooners are very dangerous vessels. They are overmasted. They have far too much canvas that they can spread. And they were known to be vulnerable to sudden squalls, which would not literally knock them over sideways and sink them. So the Royal Navy always reduced the amount of sail that these vessels captured if they tried to navigate them. Um, extremely dangerous means of transport driven by the need to outrun the anti-slavery patrol. So the 18th century pre-abolition slave trade is run in fairly standard merchant ships. Speed is not an option uh, that they need to worry about. The delivery um, of the cargo in relatively good health is the thing they're concerned about. But after abolition, the trade shifts. And some missionaries complained that what the Royal Navy's patrol was doing was actually making it more dangerous for the slaves, um, rather missing the point that it, the best thing was not to be enslaved in the first place, uh, to cross the Atlantic because they were crossing in such dangerous vessels. So a significant number of those casualties are not disease casualties, they're marine accident casualties. Um, slave ships disappear um, because they're overmastered, they're trying too hard, and they're overloaded on, on occasion as well. So they're, they're dying of many different things, uh, which would include scurvy. Um, I think this may be a, a question that you, you, you may not want to comment on. We may come on to this in a later lecture, but if you can, please do. Um, one, one, que one question asks if you could comment on the Indian slave trade, and he he comments that his wife is a descendant of plantation slaves in Madras. Um, no, unfortunately, you, you have uh, you have found me out. That is that is not an area where I've I've done any any work with at, at all. Yeah, okay. So I really don't. I'm, I'm very sorry to say I don't have a, a position I can I can offer you on that. Well, let, let's hope. We I get think I think what what the question emphasizes is that we have to see this in a global context. It, Slave trading is going on in many places across history uh, and in between many different communities. Um, the entire ancient world is powered by, by slavery. Um, so when we look at one slave trade, we have to be aware that we, we are only looking at one part of this, uh, this complex issue. And this is a part of the slave trade that Britain was in a position to do something about. Um, and the question that may be asked of, of the trade in India is who is doing the trading and what is the relationship of that trade with the regional powers? But as I say, I don't have an answer to that. But I think you know, getting that question in context is going to be important to understanding what's going on 
um, and where the responsibility lies. You know, who is commoditizing these people? Um, who is purchasing them? Um, and how does the market work? So if, if, if we treat this rather grimly in, in purely economic terms, we can start to see what's going on. Um, so well, we shall, um, um, well uh, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. We, we, we shall be doing a, a longer series on the history of slavery next year. So, and, and we shall certainly be uh, t talking about Asian slavery, both Indian and Chinese and, and elsewhere. Hello. But you touched on, econo on the economics. And of course, as you pointed out, this was always a, um, a, a, a very profitable trade in, in a certain commodity. Um, some historians, well, some, some quite a long time ago, and some very recently have argued that British policy was, it was, really, was, was really cynical. It was, it was not, it was not a, a humanitarian policy. It was, it was aimed at uh, either just expanding territory in West Africa or was aimed at um, the profits of, of, um, of trade with West Africa and that, that the suppression of slavery was, was, a, was simply a, a byproduct of this at best or, or an excuse at worst. Mm. Yes, uh, that's an argument that's certainly come around twice already uh, as a history argument. It was a very significant argument, and I suspect there is some connection uh, between the contemporary period and, and the historical writing uh, of other powers who were willing and, and indeed anxious to continue trading in slaves. Um, there's a Belgian narrative about the slave trade, which is very different and, and it indeed makes many of those points that Britain is simply doing this to damage other people's economic interests. I think the last major museum in Europe that hadn't, let's say, um, overhauled its interpretation of relations with Africa in the 19th century was indeed in Brussels. Um, the French would certainly take this view. Um, here are the British uh, using their power to stop us doing something uh, and then pretending it's a moral issue. So, and of course, the British economy in the West Indies is changing. And the only reason that the British are able to abolish the slave trade and then to abolish slavery as well is because the political consequence of West Indian merchant traders and plantation owners is ebbing away. 1833 is the very year after the Reform Act has changed the basis of political power in England. And those two things are absolutely connected. An unreformed parliament would almost certainly have had more interest in plantation slavery at the very least and may well have blocked that move. But the reformed parliament is able to push that through. So I think I can't imagine that anybody looks at this in, in the period that these decisions are being taken without considering those issues, because that would be remarkably unprofessional. But on the other hand, this is a moral imperative, which has been voted through in the middle of the greatest war that Britain has to that date ever fought um, by a very determined government with the support of the House of Commons. So. I don't see this as some kind of conspiracy. Uh, I do see this as a demonstration of popular support uh, for this cause. Um, the cause of abolition had been strong long before the abolition of the trade, uh, let alone the abolition of slavery. So yes, there may be uh, interpretations that suggest it's a purely cynical move. I would suggest that it may be a combination of both. Um, tend to find that uh, it, the more extreme interpretations uh, need to be modified um, by the practical business on the ground. Uh, the British government could do this because the power of, this, of the, the 18th century slave economy in the West Indies had been greatly reduced by the rise of other economic factors. That doesn't mean the British didn't stop this for moral reasons. So I think both interpretations are there. And it's very much a question of balancing your assessment of where you think the, the, pr the primary driver of this lays. And I, at quite considerable cost, after all, both the cost of the, of the patrol itself, the, Nav the Navy's commitment, and uh, uh, effectively ransoming the slaves by paying off their, their owners. That was, was, the, was the cost of the patrol considerable? <laughs> 
Yes, um, the the anti slavery patrol is is a very is a very significant element of the navy budget. After eighteen fifteen, this enormous navy that the British have created to fight the French and the Americans and everybody else, um, almost all of it is paid off. Almost all of the sailors are are released from service, and it will not be mobilized again um, up to a particularly large number until the First World War. So. The anti-slavery patrol is about 15 to occasionally 20 percent of the active Royal Navy deployed outside UK waters. And given the global reach of the Royal Navy and the range of tasks it's conducting, that's a very significant figure because these are small ships. So it's not that you're deploying your large vessels here. These are small ships, but numerous. And mm. the turnover of ships and crew is rapid. Tropical waters are not good for ships, let alone people. Uh, the hot, wet conditions are very negative for Northern European built ships, which is why the Royal Navy used a lot of ships built in Bombay from Indian teak. And you will find teak built ships operating in this theater because they're more durable. Mm, yes. And that includes the Trincomalee, which was built in Bombay in 1817 uh, and was then deployed to the Caribbean. Again, another hot, wet climate. And still and still and still there. So yes. some people ought to go have a look at if we're in that part of the world. Um, th there's a final question. I guess then we should let you go as you've been very patient and uh, uh, and given us a great, uh, you know, very full measure of, uh, of your of your uh, knowledge of on this subject. Um, but the, someone has said, well, the threat to kill slaves, which I, was something I mentioned, well, surely they could have just let them go. And I think I ought to answer that question, which is simply that the, the, risk, the risk of having a lot of freed slaves running around was, was too great. So, you know, normally you would, you would capture slaves and sell them on to as, as fast as you could. You, you, you couldn't risk having a lot of freed slaves around with, uh, with, with, with natural resentment against what you'd done to them. So no, that was... You, you see this on the on the West African coast, where in some places the the remains of these fortresses, which are essentially defend, defended prisons, uh, remain where where the enslaved peoples were kept until they could be shipped off. And so there's a there's a great synergy between the the local suppliers, uh, the the agents who are going to handle the finances, the the transport links, and then the the, the final purchases. Uh, on the other side of the Atlantic and taking out different pieces of that system in different places um, compromised and, and ultimately degraded the trade, uh, the introduction of alternative patterns, uh, alternative exchanges of goods uh, began to, to weaken the, the dominance of this as a West African export commodity and ultimately the closure of the markets finished it. The Royal Navy didn't stop the Atlantic slave trade, but it made it more and more difficult for that trade to persist. And it was able to stop parts of the trade with the Brazilian trade being the standout item. And then it's, it was there right at the end when the American trade disappeared as well. So it's, you know, it's very difficult to stop long established trading patterns when you've got supply, demand, and willing transport systems. And what the Royal Navy was doing was taking out the transport system as far as possible. But as we know in illegal activity to this day, where there are cargoes that, are, that can be carried at high price, there will always be individuals who are prepared to take that risk uh, in order to acquire the economic rewards. Well, um, if I'm not um, presuming too much on your patience, could I ask you two last very quick questions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one, one is one, one, one sees a lot of somewhat different figures for the number of people released by Royal Navy ships who, of captured from captured slavers. What was what figure would you give? That would be one of my questions. And the other one, which I think you can probably answer very quickly, when, as far as you know, is the very last n Royal Naval action against uh, slave, a slave uh, ship anywhere in the world? I'll answer the last one uh, first. Uh, it was probably last year. Um, it was 
again, it would have been stopping and searching a ship, probably in the Arabian Gulf, Indian Ocean region, uh, that was carrying um, migrant workers who had been recruited illegally. So people trafficking is, is still going on, and the Royal Navy is still doing the same job. If there's enough intelligence, you can stop ships that are trafficking people uh, and release them. So this is ongoing business. This, this has never finished. Um, the, the figures that are given, and you're right, Robert, there are, there are many figures. Uh, I don't think any of them are correct. Um, I would look at them all and probably just average them out and just accept that we're never going to, to have a, a really accurate figure for this. Uh, there are so many reasons why the figures will not be accurate. Uh, not the least of which is, of course, that the Royal Navy captors who released the slaves were paid head money. So they had a business in inflating the numbers of people they'd liberated. Uh, later on, when the equipment clause came in, uh, the government had to give them prize money for the vessel um, to make sure that they were sufficiently motivated uh, to go after empty ships. Uh, so I, I don't think any of these figures are absolutely reliable, but I think if we average them out, we've, we get an indicative figure, which is you know, significant, but it, it's not a figure that is going to end the trade. You know, in no year does the Royal Navy release more slaves than a trans, more than 50% of the slaves that transported across the Atlantic. Uh, it'd be much lower figure than that year on year. And as a result, they are never going to stop this trade uh, as long as there is demand on the opposite side of the Atlantic. And that is the ultimate mechanism by which the trade will be ended. So when the last Commodore in West Africa says, look, there is nothing happening here, it, it's over, we can stop doing this. Um, it's because nobody is buying slaves in the new world. It's illegal in the United States now, in all places. Brazil has long since ceased importing, but Brazil has not abolished the status of slave, and it will not do that until the 1880s. So slavery persists in the new world, but the trade that supports it does not. Thank well, you. On, that, on that note, thank you. Uh, let me thank you again, Andrew, for that fascinating lecture and for very your very interesting slides too. And, and to thank everyone who, is, uh, who took part and uh, those who asked such interesting questions. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you again, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone. It's been a, my pleasure.